If you would like your presentation to be brighter, we have to turn off the house lights. It's fine with me. Whatever. Uh, is this actually full bright? Well, it's actually, a presentation it's, then. It's a dim slide. Yeah, the first slide is dim, but oh, we'll all slide here. Um, Basically, that's up to them. That's up to them. I don't care. Um, Just take a poll at the beginning, and I'll stand in the back. Play it by ear. Yeah, or use your judgment. You guys do whatever you think is right. You, you this was as thin as it gets for presentation mode. Yeah. Oh, really? At the next next darker is the whole class is dark. It's all or nothing? Yeah, there's more lights. I can always add more. There's a chalkboard light, there's a classroom light. Okay. Well, this, this is a misleading slide. It is purposefully very dark. Um, so don't... Don't you judge by it. But. I was not. We have we'll a, take a look and see. We have a poll of the audience. Small poll. I think the, the, the audience rules. <coughs> so. so your family I think that's a bit of that. Time, well, it's been dramatized with time, I think. Oh, I'm pretty sure Mr. Todd Dramatic or traumatic? Both. Yeah, definitely dramatic. <laughs> this is Leah. I think you built that up. <laughs> you said Mr. Mike is going to talk about our space. <laughs> no, no doctor. Can I say that as my That would be fine. <laughs> you can say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> like a Celsa sitting in the back who's going to call me on anything that's not right. Oh, uh, the format is an hour. That's your lecture time. We'll take a five minute break for people to make graceful exits. Uh, and then questions and answers for 20 minutes. I'll give you a cue to wrap it up and take the last question. Okay. I was only going to go about 45. Fine. I think people. People, I've had as short as 20 minutes. Okay. And as long as an hour and 10 minutes. So. I'd love to leave time for questions. We tend to get it's topics that tend to bring pretty good questions. No, I made this on the short side. Somehow I had. If you just take a slight break then, just so that people can get up and go to okay, the so without bothering everyone. Okay, so wait, so. I end. Dun, 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 dun. And then what? You say. I'll take a five minute break. Okay. I can do it for you or you can do it yourself. Okay, it'd be good if you stepped in. That'll be fine. And then I will cue you when the question and the answers are over. You can answer privately on, in the foyer, but I have to close up the room by nine. Oh gosh, I want to be long gone by nine. I would hope so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I won't cut any short. That's great. But I'll, uh, yeah, I was hoping to just spark. I was hoping we'd have lots of conversation after. I would hope there's enough fodder in the first 45 minutes to yield good discussion thereafter. How's that? After I turn off the lights, I'll just be. I, I usher people in, so I'm back and forth from the front desk. Okay. That's good. I think that's everything you need to know. Yeah. Being recorded. Fire accidents. Just kidding. You don't need to know anything. What to do in a case of emergency? I think I think Earthquake like somewhere deep in <laughs> some like border regions thing. I'm, I don't do that, but the provost, I was in a meeting with the provost recently in like a regular conference room. She started off by informing everyone of the evacuation policies. And I didn't write that down, so I will probably forget it as soon as I start talking. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> And if you're ready, I'm ready, okay. and we shall be good. Good evening, everybody.
My name is Janice. I'd like to welcome you to Discover Alaska Lecture Series. This event is sponsored by Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning and the UAF Geophysical Institute. Just a few announcements. At this time, if you could silence your cell phones, that would be appreciated. If you need the restrooms, there are exit the auditorium, take a left. It'll be right by the exit sign on the left. Tomorrow night we have the Rock Bottom Stompers at the Music in the Gardens, George's and Botanical Gardens. It starts at 7 p.m. We'll be there, rain or shine, so please be there. <laughs> we'll enjoy the company. Next week for Magical Monday, we'll be featuring math in a cultural context as everyone makes a Yupik Fish Camp doll. On Tuesday, Healthy Living Tuesdays, we will have a lecture on robotic surgery and technologic advances in surgery. I'd like to hand the mic over to Leah Gardine. She's Public Relations Assistant at the Geophysical Institute, and she will be introducing Dr. Webb. Hello, everyone. Um, so I work at the Geophysical Institute. I work pretty closely with, uh, with Mike West over there at the Alaska Earthquake Center. So Mike is the state seismologist, the Alaska state seismologist, and the director of the Alaska Earthquake Center. Uh, which is housed over at the Geophysical Institute. And so I've known Mike going on 10 years now. Uh, he was, I have my master's degree in seismology and Mike was one of my committee members. He was one of my tougher committee members if I remember correctly. <laughs> but, uh, but he's a great person to be around, knows a lot about earthquakes and I knew him back when he worked for the uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory. So he's gonna come up and talk to you today about 50 years of earthquake science here in Alaska and. I don't know, I'm sure most of you know that this is the 50th anniversary of the Great Alaska Earthquake. And so he's just going to tell you a little bit about what's, what's happened in Alaska since that big earthquake. So I'd like to bring up to the front Dr. Michael West. <laughs> battery out of the bottom. There we go. Okay, so we won't get feedback. Cool, well thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, there were certainly other options you had. If I had a free Wednesday evening right now, I'd probably be down at uh, Hot Licks with ice cream instead of up there in a dark conference room. So thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, I got a question just for starters so I understand who everybody is. Uh, who lives here? Awesome. Mostly low. So you gotta raise your hand if you don't live here. Who's visiting? Where are you visiting from? England. England. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, that's, I'm talking to, to uh, the insiders uh, here. Uh, how many of you were here for the 1964 earthquake? Okay, just a handful. Uh, I was not, full disclosure, I just had a birthday. I'm 44, and uh, I, I, know I felt a little awkward this year. I, I've, I've spoken a lot about the earthquake, and at first I, I felt yeah, I felt a little out of place. I felt like I, I couldn't honestly speak authoritatively when there are people in the room who have, uh, in some cases, very dramatic experiences uh, you know, associated with the earthquake. Who the hell am I to talk about that event? Um, but what I have, I've come around on that. Because what I do know, uh, I, as director of the Alaska Earthquake Center, I, I'm privileged to work with a spectacular group of people, and I get the opportunity to interact with citizens, businesses, policymakers, and whatnot around the state. And everywhere I go, I see the influences and the impacts of an event that was 50 years ago. So though I may not have been alive, uh, the fact is it very much shaped the Alaska that I know. So I've come around on this, and I, I feel, uh, uh, you know, well, more enthusiastic about talking about it, let's say. So uh, I want to start off, I, have three, I just want you to learn three things tonight. That's my goal. I hope you walk out of here with, with three points, and uh, we'll, uh, the, the basic format of this is I want to go through three topics. That's it. But I want to start out with a little warm-up. Um, here's a pie chart that we are going to fill in uh, with... Uh, earthquake energy. So take all the energy from all the earthquakes in the United States over the last 50 years. Thousands and thousands and thousands of earthquakes, 
some big, some small. We're going to add them all together. And we're going to look at what the contributors are to the energy, uh, our little energy pie chart here. And that slice of the pie right there, that's something like a tenth of it, represents the 2002 Denali Fault earthquake. Anyone feel that one? All right, a lot more hands going up. Uh, it was just a dozen years ago. Right, so that was a massive earthquake. Magnitude 7.9 is a, a, a truly significant event. Um, that's 10% yeah, of the energy release in the United States in 50 years. So um, we take the next three earthquakes. These are all in Alaska as well. In fact, the top 10 are all earthquakes that occurred uh, in Alaska. Now, there's a lot of earthquakes every day. Every day we record uh, you know, a hundred or so magnitude twos and threes, and we add up all of those through all the years. We take all the rest of the earthquakes in Alaska, we get about 90% of the way of the pie chart, and that leaves this little sliver uh, right up here for the other 49 states uh, added <laughs> together. Now, I, I admit, I did this pie chart a couple of years ago. You see the dates, 1960 to 2010. Uh, the astute observer will see that I've left off yes. two earthquakes out of this list. Uh, one is the 1964 earthquake, and the second, a, a much lesser known earthquake, but scientifically very significant. The following year, 1965, there was another tremendously large earthquake, uh, albeit uh, in the Aleutians, it didn't do uh, you know, a fraction of the damage. But I left those off of this pie chart because if I were to include them, the chart would look something like this. <laughs> And the take-home point from this, what I want you to appreciate, is that the energy released in the 1964 earthquake is more than three-quarters of all of the energy of all earthquakes in the nation for 50 years. If you took everything else that happened, including the Denali Fault earthquake, you still would have just this, you know, just this piece up in here. So if you're going to learn something from an earthquake, uh, 1964 was, whether we wanted to or not, was the, the event uh, to do that. So there's a long list of lessons uh, learned from the earthquake. And as I said, I, I won't drag you through all of them, but I'm going to take you through uh, a list of the top three. Hey, if do people want the lights dimmed, or would you prefer them as they are? There seems to be a resounding yes for dimming the lights. Okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is Governor uh, Governor uh, Bill Egan, who was governor at the time of the 1964 earthquake. This photo is one that uh, really, to me, captures a lot of things. This is Valdez. Uh, this is Valdez on fire in the background. He was in Juneau at the time, but it's my understanding they had they had a, uh, a family home uh, in Valdez that was destroyed during the earthquake. This was taken a couple days uh, after, and I'm not going to go through a lot of slides. Of 1964 tonight. I'm going to focus on the 50 years uh, since. You've seen countless, probably, articles and other places. There's been some spectacular summaries uh, of the earthquake. I was in Anchorage uh, earlier today, actually, and the uh, Anchorage Museum has a, a, a first rate uh, exhibit running through September if you get the opportunity. Well worth it. Uh, anyway, but I, this, this is the one photo I really want to show from the earthquake because. I, I stared at this photo for a long time, and I swear I, I, I tried to read into what is going through his head. Here's a state, he's responsible for uh, what ends up being a very substantial recovery effort, tremendous interaction uh, with, with Washington, and yet at the same time, uh, you know, their, their home, uh, one of their homes, was destroyed uh, in this earthquake and dealing with just you know, the family components of this, friends, uh, I know uh, friends of the Egans who were lost uh, in the earthquake. So a lot of things, but I can't help but sort of guess, when I look at that expression, that there's something kind of forward-looking about it. He's not just thinking about what's going on in the background, but kind of the where do we go from here, what next. Uh, and, and that could be a bunch of baloney, but um, that's, that's what I see in this uh, figure. Photograph really. So, kind of with that intro, I want to go into our three. You know, what are the things that were not known at this time that now would fundamentally change how we would uh, interpret an earthquake uh, like 1964? So, the first one is the concept of a local tsunami. And I put it in quotes because we're still searching for a good term 
Sometimes you'll hear them called landslide tsunamis. But uh, this was a, a topic, a, a, a term that didn't really exist in 1964. This is a figure you probably are familiar with. This represents what, how, how tsunamis are usually portrayed to us. In this case, we have an earthquake in Alaska. This is actually uh, modeled on 1964. And each of these lines shows where, uh, how many hours it takes for this massive tsunami wave to propagate out across the ocean. And you know, we're, this is a story we're well acquainted with. If you think back to the 2004 Sumatra earthquake, right? if you happen to be following the events of that day, we watched this play out in gruesome detail. You know, A handful of hours, uh, or you know, it was the immediate effects in Indonesia, but it was really several hours later when other parts across the Indian Ocean uh, were hit and struck by the tsunami. This is the image we all carry around in our head, and this is accurate. It's true, and it happened in 1964. That earthquake you know, killed people in California. Uh, actually, it was not uh, deadly in Hawaii, but did plenty of damage. Um, and so that was a real part of 1964. But I want you to think for a moment, not about the people in Japan, nine hours away from the source, but rather the people who were underneath that star. A very, very different set of things happens there. And some things that we did not uh, appreciate or understand until actually well into the 90s. It was just in the last 15 years or so, 15, 20 years, that we began to get a handle on what happened in some of Alaska's coastal towns. This is an aerial photograph of Seward taken before uh, the earthquake. This is an aerial photograph of Seward taken in the days after the earthquake. It's a little hard to see, but there's a red line traced out there. That was the extent of water. That was the high water mark, if you will, of the tsunami in Seward. And you'll see that there are considerable areas of town uh, where you know, whole, whole city blocks uh, were raised by the water uh, generated uh, in, in, the, in the tsunami. So just for comparison, here's a photograph of today, or actually about a decade ago. It's actually grown since then. This is just a, a reminder about how quickly our, uh, our, our memories and our, uh, our appreciation for the forces of an earthquake like this uh, fade. But Seward presented a very significant problem. Uh, for those who, who, who know Seward, you know, it's in Resurrection Bay. It's in a long, narrow fjord. It's not easy to get a big tsunami wave to propagate into the fjord. In some ways, it is protected. That's the reason it's a port. That's why Seward was a, a, a dominant port in Alaska, especially prior to the earthquake, because it's a, it was a safe harbor. So when people, when scientists set out to model the tsunami and try and recreate, how did, this, how did that line actually happen? They couldn't get the data to fit. It didn't work. You couldn't take the earthquake as we knew it and make waves that were nearly high enough to do this kind of damage. And again, it really wasn't until the, the, the well into the 90s that people began to appreciate what happened. And what we now understand is that underwater landslides played a tremendous role in 1964. So this is just a little uh, video. Uh, produced uh, here at UAF that kind of demonstrates this, uh, if I can get to the right place, let's see, that demonstrates this concept. We're going to look underneath the water, and we're going to look at a landslide. So here's a, a land sloughing off the side. You can kind of see a wave up above. Let's go above and look at the top side of the water now. And you're seeing a tsunami, right there, that's a tsunami right there. You're seeing waves that strike shore just immediately, right there, right next to where they happen. And Seward's a spectacular place. Right? Well, there's a reason that you know, the tourism industry is strong there. Like, like many other towns, Seward, Valdez, Cordova, these are spectacular places. And the reason, by and large, you've got tremendous mountains, right? This narrow fjord, snow-capped peaks, and a little, uh, you know, nice little bay in there. These are breeding grounds 
for landslides. The, 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 the coastal mountains in Alaska are eroding incredibly fast. There is there are tremendous amounts of, of dirt and rock and debris that are sloughing off of those mountains every day. People are always surprised. Right? You go to a you go to a Valdez and you expect a nice crystal clear stream, and in fact you have this milky, chalky, sort of glacially fed uh, waters that, that are carrying tons of sediment. Well, all that sediment is dumped into the bays where towns like Seward uh, and Valdez and Whittier uh, sit. So on the seafloor, uh, just off the coast of these towns, you have tremendous amounts of sediment sitting there that's very loose, unconsolidated, and it's very easy to move. So if you were to map, or actually they did, when the seafloor of Seward was mapped uh, uh, I think sometime in the 90s, what they recognized is there were, there were landslide deposits everywhere, all over the bay. So this is Resurrection Bay. Seward is that speck up there uh, in the corner. And these, these dark brown patches are landslides that are known to have moved during 1964. So we're going to look at uh, not a cartoon animation, but an actual uh, rendering uh, done here at the Supercomputing Center uh, showing the movement of these landslides over just a couple of minutes into the earthquake. And these, remember this is all underwater, and these soils, once mobilized, filled in almost the whole bay. So we're going to zoom in on Seward now, we're going to watch it again, and notice even the coast right there where Seward sits uh, moved during uh, this process. The earthquake lasted four or five minutes. So one of the take-home points for me is that the, the tsunami <coughs> waves that struck much of coastal Alaska hit before the earthquake was even over. And that is a fundamentally different way of thinking about tsunamis than we usually do. We're used to thinking, oh, the earthquake occurred, the clock starts ticking, you got five hours to you know, get the police down to the beach, sound the evacuation uh, alarms, and uh, clear out the beach so that everyone can be prepared and the hatches can be batted down when the uh, tsunami comes. <laughs> that's not what can happen. That's not what happens uh, for our towns in 64, and it's likely to, it's likely to be that way in the future. Um, you have you know, seconds really. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sobering uh, thought. If there's any, uh, oh actually here, I have another video, sorry. Let's watch the, the exact same video now, but this time, instead of watching the landslides on the seafloor, let's look at the waves in Resurrection uh, Bay that would be modeled uh, from this. And the, the, the take home point from this that you're going to see is you're not going to see this nice, you know, monolithic wave racing across the ocean, again, our standard picture of a tsunami. What, what really happened really just looks like chaos in a bathtub to me. It's just every which way things are happening, all just in the first couple minutes. We're going to again zoom in on Seward, and I want you to notice, uh, you'll see a wave coming from right over here across the bay, that within a matter of a minute or two, that one right there, strikes Seward. And that actually was the wave that was responsible for much of the inundation uh, that we saw. And this was, again, decades. This was a lesson that took decades to begin to unravel. If we look at the fatalities from the 1964 earthquake, this is a figure uh, the Anchor Daily News uh, here a couple months ago, they did a nice job. If you look at all the different causes uh, of deaths during uh, the earthquake, what you find is that the majority, or more than half, of the people who perished in the 1964 earthquake were killed by what we would term local tsunamis. So if we have a single killer, if you want to isolate a single sort of greatest hazard in an earthquake like this, based on 1964 for us, it is these local tsunamis. I'm not sure there's a silver lining uh, to this at all, but certainly uh, one of the things that is unique 
uh, I find in Alaska and particularly in our coastal communities is everyone, people are aware, people understand that earthquakes are part of the, the fabric of this state. You don't have to go through the exercise that you do in most parts of this country where you have to first convince people that earthquakes are possible. You know, the evacuation routes uh, that are that are derived from these kinds of models and the, uh, the weekly tests of tsunami sirens, even the uh, shakeout exercises where people crawl into their desk, you know, those take on a whole lot more meaning when your neighbor can tell you where they were in 1964. I can't tell you how many presentations I've given like this where someone comes up afterward and shares a story that just, I mean, blows you away, breaks your heart, and uh, just really adds incredible perspective. So it's, I don't want to say we're fortunate, but we have tens of thousands of people in this state with stories that, uh, let's say, m motivate at least uh, our, our, uh, our preparedness for earthquakes. Okay, topic number two. We got number one, local tsunami, but I beat it pretty hard there. Lake tectonics. Uh, this was a, only a, a, a kind of a vague uh, scientific theory, a notion that had been floating around in meetings uh, in 1964. I love this figure. This is a, a figure that was published in Life magazine 14 days after the earthquake. So April 10th, 1964. And I feel a little bad at showing this, but there's almost nothing that is factually correct about this figure. It's, I guess they got, they got the location of Valdez and Anchorage right. But um, first off, the Earth did not move side to side. There was no big, you know, this is like a San Andreas fault type motion here. Uh, the earthquake actually happened on the other side of Valdez uh, and Anchorage. And in fact, the earthquake didn't even rupture the ground. There is no big fault scarp from the 1964 earthquake. Um, so I, I put this up not to poke fun at it, uh, but to to uh, illustrate that we've come a tremendous way, a long, tremendous distance in our understanding in the past uh, 50 years. We now have a, a framework that uh, provides some explanation for why uh, an earthquake like this uh, would happen. We now have the concept of plate tectonics. This notion uh, existed in 1964. It was one of these things you could go to a scientific meeting and you hear, you know, the crazy guy in the corner with his idea of plate tectonics that people were still like, oh, that's a nice idea, you know, but show me. Show me some evidence. And I have some sympathy because geology is a very hard thing to see. Geology doesn't happen in front of your eyes. You know, the rocks in our front yard probably look exactly like they did 100 years ago. You can't go outside. Hey, kids, let's go watch you know, plate tectonics today. You don't do that. It happens on tremendously slow time scales. So when you're looking for evidence of something, you have to look uh, pretty hard. Um, what happened in 1964, though, is that plate tectonics happened very suddenly. And this is why I'm a seismologist. I'm in the earthquake business because I have a very short attention span. And I can't deal with things that take millions of years to happen. But there are a handful of processes that actually happen very quickly in geology, namely earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, landslides. Mm, that's, that's a big chunk of it right there. And what happened, uh, we, we, uh, we now have this plate tectonics framework. So here's a, here's a nice cross-section of what we refer to as a subduction zone. Uh, this would be a cross-section through Alaska up here. And if you imagine the Pacific Ocean to the south, uh, down here, we have, you know, as the different plates slide around on the surface of the Earth, I think most of you have been exposed to this idea, uh, you know, uh, the Pacific plate is being pushed underneath Alaska, being thrust uh, down. And these two plates, I mean, we're talking about huge land masses. They don't slide very easily. There's no ball bearings in there or anything. So they, they, they get stuck on each other. They get locked together. And what happens you know, as they move all of two and a half inches per year, anyway, you can move two and a half inches per year, that's, that's ridiculously small. Um, well, it is small, but give it 10 years, that's 25 inches. 
Give it 100 years, that's 250 inches. What's that, 20, 20 feet or so? Uh, now, now you're starting to talk about significant amounts of Earth that kind of need to be accommodated somewhere. So over the course of a few hundred years, as these two plates are locked together, we're going to go to the next slide here. You can kind of think of Alaska as a big spring. Okay, and you know, it can accommodate a little compression. You, you can squish the dirt, you can squish the rocks a little bit. So over the course of a few hundred years, you go from this situation to something a bit more like this. The land has been compressed, and it's storing up, just like a spring, it's storing up that energy. Each year, getting loaded a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more, until eventually, that, that surface there, the friction holding them in place, can no longer hold. So that's it. And it ruptures suddenly, instantly, catastrophically, and goes from this situation back to its starting point. So you can kind of think of it, you know, if it takes hundreds of years to build up, you know, that energy is released in a matter of seconds. That is an earthquake. And in a nutshell, that is the source. That is the cause right there of the 1964 earthquake and of most of the truly massive earthquakes in the world. When you get into the magnitude eight and a half and above, with very few exceptions, this is the mechanism. Japan, Sumatra, Chile, Alaska, the really big ones, this is what's happening. So here's another, uh, just another rendering of the same thing, this kind of cartoon. What I, what I want you to appreciate out of this is that here, here's Alaska. We've kind of flipped it around the other way now, but uh, here's Alaska. If you look at the motion of the land, think about this for a minute. Uh, when the earthquake has been, when all that energy has been built up and it is finally released, there are two significant motions. Right out here by the ocean, the land pops up. After being kind of dragged down for a long time, finally it rebounds back to where it was. So it goes up. And inland from that, you actually get some subsidence. You get land that kind of, as it uh, sort of recoils, can go, can go back down. And the reason 1964 was, it was so significant in the theory of plate tectonics is that this motion, these two motions, are exactly what we're seeing. In the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, as people went around, they found that there were whole areas where the beaches, where the mountains, where everything had been lifted up. And what was once at sea level was now 20 feet above sea level. That happened you know, immediately during the earthquake. And if you went inland, uh, going, you know, if, you go, if you went inland, you saw just the opposite. You saw things that had been just above sea level that were now permanently below sea level and were inundated with water. The town of Portage, uh, which no longer exists, is out on the, out on the flats uh, here in uh, the Turnigan Arm, I guess, uh, you know, no longer existed because in an instant it dropped below sea level permanently. So the, these are features, because of the role of, because these all happened, this happened right at sea level, this made things really easy to see. You didn't need some fancy surveying or anything. I mean, places where docks, I mean, here's a dock, uh, I forget where this was, uh, that you know, once had sat right at sea level and was now permanently you know, far above sea level. This is, this is easy to see. There's no mistaking what happened here. And then, of course, you have the ghost forests of Kinnick Arm, Kennegan Arm, where uh, you know, forests were now dropped down to sea level or below. Salt water rushed in and killed the trees, but the dead trees still stand today. You see these when you drive, if you drive to Anchorage, uh, right as you kind of round the bend past Palmer, you look out, this is exactly what you'll see. That's what it's from. So this provided that moment. This, this ability to go out and see you know, instantly after the earthquake, huge areas of land that were uplifted and huge down. This was an aha moment where you can say, ah, that. That's plate tectonics. Previously, it had been a, a, you know, this kind of airbrain theory, and 1964 was one of a handful of events that turned it into what I would call kind of textbook fact, because you can actually provide you know, data. To me, it's a little like the particle uh, physicists. You know, they come up with these uh, 
crazy theory is that we come up with these particles that are supposed to exist. It, what did we just find last year? The uh, Higgs boson, I think. You know, that existed on paper in someone's theory for a few decades. But it takes a long time before the observationalists can go out and actually find that in nature. Same, with, same thing with plate tectonics. The theories, the ideas were there. But it took the 1964 earthquake to say, aha, and there's the data for it. There's the proof. So uh, I, I really can't overstress how fundamental that earthquake was uh, in helping to prove and bring plate tectonics to maturity. In, in Alaska, what it did for us is it provided some context for why earthquakes happen. Um, it took earthquakes from being just sort of in the random act of God category to the, okay, seems like we should be having earthquakes because here are some of the processes that are going on. I'd be lying if I said we understood all of it today, but uh, you know, the earthquakes that, that occur in Alaska, all through the Aleutians, up, well up into the interior, extending uh, up into northern Alaska, all down through southeast, all of these can be explained in sort of this, this plate tectonics uh, framework. So in state, it had that effect of giving us some context for well, why, why us? Why do we get all these earthquakes? Well, that's why. OK, the third thing uh, that I think we began to appreciate after 1964 is that we as a state needed to begin figuring out how to live with earthquakes. Yeah. They'd always been around. Everybody knew there were lots of earthquakes in Alaska. But 1964 drove home the significance of, well, the, the, the power of what they could do. So it was a, you know, a turning point um, for us in that way. And you know, here's the, these are the earthquakes I showed just a moment ago. Uh, at the Earthquake Center, we're reporting on yeah, about 30 to 35,000 earthquakes in the state every year right now. The, the vast majority of these are very small. A handful of them are, are, are much larger. But, um, you know, this is the, we, we, I think what's changed since 64 is there are several different groups in the state actively engaged in the question, well, how do we deal with this problem? So I put up for, for an example uh, the earthquakes that have been happening in northwestern Alaska this year. You might have followed this. You might have seen it somewhere out in NOATAC. They've had uh, a series of five magnitude 5.7 earthquakes. Um, not common in this area. Not unprecedented either, but certainly not that common. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, how do we begin to plan for something like this? Do we just sit here and wait for something bad to happen? Or can we estimate, you know, where are the danger areas? Where are the areas that are safe. If there's earthquakes located here where the red stars are, you know, where's the shaking uh, likely to be? So this is a computation here that shows the yellow shaded areas of where uh, strong ground motions are expected, where strong shaking is expected from earthquakes here. And it's not just a circle around the earthquake. There's a lot of things that come into play. What you can probably see with your eye is that this valley the valley of the Noatak River is by far the most susceptible uh, area. Those are the areas where, you know, at the moment I, I don't believe there are building codes that are in use in Noatak, but hypothetically speaking, if you were going to do uh, some planning, you know, the, uh, you would want a different set of considerations down in the lowlands here than you would in the, uh, up in the hills. And I, I, you know, I shouldn't malign them uh, that way. Uh, Red Dog Mine, which is out there, actually has a whole host of its own issues. They've taken this problem very seriously uh, through the years, and they've done their studies, and you know, they have some understanding of what they need to plan for and what they don't. But this kind of thinking, what do we need to plan for, uh, is something that has certainly changed uh, in this state. We can go one step further and say, OK, now that we know where the shaking might be, what should we expect as impacts? This is a, a, a figure from a report uh, that's underway right now for Kodiak. This is Kodiak Island. And it goes through building by building in Kodiak for a given sort of scenario earthquake, a particular earthquake which is anticipated 
There's a possibility in that area, and tries to estimate losses on individual structures. So the Coast Guard facility and things down here obviously uh, stand to suffer some of the greatest losses uh, in the earthquake. And then you can see the individual houses, which are put down here in the $10,000 to $100,000 damage uh, estimate range. This is, this is all approximate. A lot of things can happen. But this is the, this is the way to prepare. This is the homework you ideally want to do uh, prior to an earthquake. And all of that, at some level, has to be derived uh, from data. So if we go back to 1964, this big yellow area, this is the area that actually ruptured. That's the fault, the, the, the portion of land that moved during the earthquake. Uh, there were two seismograph stations in Alaska at the time, one uh, here on the UAF campus, uh, and one in Sitka really doesn't matter. They both went off scale during the earthquake, so it's not like they provided deep data. Uh, however, the, the earthquake was recorded globally. Um, but you know, that, there you really couldn't do a scientific investigation of the earthquake based on the data at hand uh, in this state. We to this day we don't know how much. In, in, in terms of numbers, we, we can't actually quantify how much shaking there was in Anchorage, for example. I was at a, a conference here in Anchorage. There's a bunch of earthquake engineers in town. This is actually something they are debating today. How much shaking actually happened in Anchorage in 1964? Because it, it simply wasn't measured. Today, uh, there's a network of about 400 seismic stations uh, across Alaska, operated by several uh, different agencies, uh, including our own. Uh, we bring in all of that data to the Earthquake Center uh, here at UAF. And it's, while, while there are large swaths of the state that remain uh, really without instrumentation, in fact, we can do a much better job today of measuring how much the ground actually shakes uh, during an earthquake. So a little propaganda slide. Uh, this, is, this is where I work. This is the building. Uh, <laughs> You know, you're, you're in the crown jewel sort of building of uh, UAF right now. This is a spectacular facility. I'm in the, uh, the kind of the rundown building next door here. Um, <laughs> my boss would like to say that. <laughs> it's a good spot, uh, but uh, that's where the Alaska Earthquake Center is located. And I've got one brief uh, plug here for our Facebook page. I mean, don't go there. Don't like us. I can care less if you like the Earthquake Center. But what I will tell you is without uh, embellishing, because I think uh, the discussion on our Facebook page has become, in the past year, the most relevant earthquake discussion going on in the state right now. Every day, there's people posting questions and uh, you know, writing in about the earthquakes they felt last night. It's been a great source. So if you, you know, you've obviously got enough uh, enthusiasm to come here on a Wednesday night and listen to me. If this doesn't uh, drive me away from the earthquake topic, I'd encourage you to go there. I work with a great group of people, uh, a whole host of folks who are involved in uh, making the whole earthquake monitoring system for the state work. We have field technicians who spend a lot of time on site uh, in keeping those, those instruments uh, running in the field. We have seismologists who do studies and report on all of the data and then the folks who analyze each of the earthquakes. A uh, whole host of different things that come together. Uh, to make this all work. I want to show you a few slides of what modern seismic instrumentation uh, looks like. The majority of our monitoring sites are in very remote places. And that's a real pain, actually. It would be much easier to simply place them in all the towns uh, and, and villages. The problem with that, the whole purpose of seismometer, I should, I should have brought one tonight, the whole purpose of a seismometer is to record vibrations. And they're, they're actually not very smart instruments. They don't record anything that shakes. Could be an earthquake. Could be a moose walking by. Could be a backhoe. Could be a generator. Could be a cement truck going down the street. Cities and towns are lousy places to record earthquakes. As a result, we try to put our instrumentation uh, in remote places uh, that are uninfluenced by that kind of thing. So. Um, again, I mentioned the, the primary goal of an instrument is to record vibrations in the ground. That means you've got to bury it. 
I confess I, I don't know which staff member of ours this is. <laughs> but, uh, but there's an instrument down inside that hole there connected to the rock. Uh, incredibly sensitive. I, I'm impressed. I'm amazed with how sensitive they really are. Uh, obviously, a lot of electronics, a lot of power systems issues. These are all remote stations. This is Sarah, one of our field technicians, is uh, configuring some, uh, some of the settings of one of our stations. A key point in all of this is that the data from these sites is of no use unless we have it immediately. It doesn't do us any good to be able to drive out six months later and pick up a, you know, a, a, a disk or something and come home and look at the data. We need that data in real time. So all of these sites send their data back via radio or cell communication or all sorts of different things. Send their data back here so that we have it in you know, one or two seconds from when it's recorded. So these are, you all know that the old paper drums with the needle that would you know, go like this, and then when an earthquake happened, the needle would go back and forth. Uh, we don't operate those anymore, uh, but really it's the exact same thing. You have that continuous flow of uh, data. There's always just a little new piece getting added on, usually flat line, every once in a while, uh, something big. So we put a lot of time and energy into the communications. This is Scott. Uh, one of our field engineers who's working on tuning a radio system uh, to bring it back in. And the whole point of this is that when we walk away from a station, when we've, when we've got everything installed, we walk away. Uh, this is a site down by Denali. Uh, it sits autonomous all by itself. We hope not to go back for a few years. Sometimes we're not that fortunate. Uh, someone posted a whole bunch of pictures on our Facebook page today of bear damage to different stations that have gotten torn apart. We're in the midst of our field season right now doing a lot of repairs. Anyway, uh, they sit here all by themselves, autonomously in a, hopefully a quiet place. Uh, and that, you know, they, they do nothing but sit there and track the day-to-day -day sort of vibrations. So seismograms aren't hard to understand. This is a, a very little earthquake, but it's pretty easy to understand. There's 15 seconds worth of data right there. Nothing happening, nothing happening, nothing happening. Oh, little earthquake. It was very short lived, it was only five seconds, went away. But I mean, anybody can read that, it's not that hard. Um, the power comes when we begin to put together seismograms recorded at different places. So these are five different seismic stations here. And you see it shows up, actually this is the no attack earthquake, or one of them, for anyone who's curious. You might be able to kind of interpret what the symbols mean. Our dog, anybody want to guess? Red dog, K-O-T-Z, Kotzebue. It gets harder from there. <laughs> but that's me, Nana. So, um, but here you can see things that are close by. See the earthquake very quickly. Locations that are far away, and it takes a little longer to get there. Um, I don't want to undermine what we do, but it's not uh, the proverbial rock science. Uh, the, the challenge is in mining all of this data in a sort of a 24-7 uh, kind of basis. But these are the fundamentals of how we report on earthquakes. You get the magnitude from how big the signals are. So when you wake up in the morning and you hear, oh, you know, magnitude 5.2 earthquake, or uh, I know we got rattled a couple weeks ago, a bunch of people felt an earthquake uh, here in town. You know, that's information, that location, they say, oh, it was 20 kilometers north of Minto, and I can see 3.5 or whatever. That's information that is derived straight from recordings like this using basically glorified triangulation and how big the signals are. Oh, here's one I left in there. Uh, this is the, the last month we had uh, the biggest earthquake in a decade. Not everyone recognizes this, but a magnitude 7.9 earthquake in the Western Aleutians uh, that was right under uh, uh, Anchitka. Actually, and these are the seismograms. This is a stunning figure to me, uh, just showing all the different seismic stations across Alaska. And you see this wave kind of moving from you know close in to farther away to farther away, and you even see kind of the same bumps showing up at one station to the next. This is this is the kind of thing that gets us pretty excited as seismologists. Um, this is not. This is kind of a complicated figure. This is actually a screenshot straight out of our uh, monitoring system over in the building uh, next door. 
running 24-7. Here's a little earthquake, that orange dot, right in Anchorage. And we can see all the stations that recorded it, all those blue triangles. Uh, this is all detected automatically by our computer system. Even then, uh, an individual goes in and fine-tunes those uh, locations. But we detect, eh, right now we're averaging about 100 of these per day. The majority of them are quite small. Uh, as I said earlier, but you know, a handful of them are much larger. And as soon as they reach a certain size, somebody responds to that, uh, again, 24-7, uh, you get the information uh, out. You can get information a whole lot of different places. I got several different phone apps that'll send earthquake information. Tsunami Warning Center does something, the USGS does something, a lot of different ways. But all of that information comes from the same sources. At the end of the day, it comes from the seismic stations uh, operated uh, by our network uh, across Alaska. We all, in 2014, everything's terribly complicated, interwoven and connected together and so forth. But that's where it all comes from. Um, and the challenge that remains for us now, I think, is this whole level of planning and preparation. This is a map of the Denali Fault uh, earthquake in 2002, much like that Melotech example I showed earlier, showing which areas shook during the earthquake and where they didn't. And I would point out the star is the epicenter. That's that, we always report on the epicenter. Where is the epicenter? Where, where was it? Well, that was the epicenter right there. And the shaking for that earthquake was not some big circle all around it. It was a very odd, interesting uh, uh, shape that followed the fault, the actual fault trace of the Denali Fault. So how do you begin to plan for earthquakes like this? Well, we know enough that we can begin, we've begun producing uh, data like this. And this is what individual communities can go to and use as they sit down and say, you know, is this an earthquake we should worry about or not? Well, Cantwell, yeah, I'm in Cantwell, I might want to be thinking about this uh, scenario. So that's kind of the state of things uh, right now. And all of this, you know, I'm excited about the progress and I'm excited about where things have gone. But I have, I, I stumble at this point because I, I get a little uncomfortable um, for all of the knowledge that we have that we didn't have 50 years ago and for all of the whiz-bang technological kinds of things that go that we now are able to do that didn't exist in 1964. It's very tempting to say, well, clearly we're better off. My gosh, we understand where the earthquakes are coming from. We know why they happen. We can measure them 18 different ways. But I will wager with anyone in this room that if the same earthquake happened today, it would be more devastating. It would be more expensive, and it would kill more people. So, I struggle with this. Are we better off in any way? Or, if you, if, the way I have begun to think about this is that we are in sort of a, a technological arms race, if you will, with society. So society is growing ever more complicated, uh, ever more sophisticated. Population continues to increase. Right? We have all sorts of really fascinating interconnected things and tremendous infrastructure uh, as society advances. And all of that is adding new vulnerability every day. So I feel like those of us in the business of earthquake preparedness are always kind of a step or two behind trying to keep up, uh, you know, trying, to keep, trying to keep ourselves as sophisticated and knowledgeable as society continues to kind of uh, uh, expand and grow. So I'm going to end on that note. It's an uncomfortable uh, one for me, but I think it's a very real thing to think about because there's definitely one, one of the undercurrents of this anniversary has been, oh, look how far we've come. Look how amazing things are now that we didn't have in 64. In fact, I think it's a very complicated uh, landscape to try to figure out. So uh, with that, I'll wrap up. I thank you for your... Uh, attention.
I've been told we should do a short break. Is that right? You're more than welcome to walk out and leave. I won't, I won't be offended in the least. Uh, oh, no, honestly. Um, and I don't know if outlets are still open. Still not. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll be here and, and we'll reconvene in a minute for those interested. Is that right? We'll take a short break. We'll reconvene in five minutes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>
um, science. I, I can't rule it out, but it certainly doesn't appear around the corner in any way. Where we have made advances, and sort of the one of the more cutting edge things that's happening right now, is rapid notification of an earthquake. So take 1964 for an example. That earthquake began under Prince William Sound, actually not too far from Valdez. It was off. I mean, 80, 90 miles from Anchorage. Use Anchorage as an example. Well, let's use Kodiak. Kodiak's an even better example. This is five, three, 350 miles or so from the epicenter. It was minutes. This is a couple minutes before those waves, the shaking, actually reached Kodiak. So imagine for a moment that we knew the instant an earthquake started. We said, ah, earthquake started right there, warn everybody. In Kodiak, you could, in theory, have, let's call it two minutes of warning. Now, two minutes isn't as nice as three or four days. Uh, you can't, you know, get in your car and drive out of town. But you can do a lot of things in two minutes. You can stop traffic. You can, you know, uh, maybe tell the plane that's about to land, you know, why don't you take one more pass before coming down? <laughs> An example that's often used, you know, for the surgeon is, you know, flip, lift the knife. <laughs> let's, let's just pause for a moment. Um, this is what's called earthquake early warning. And that is a very, very active development in this country uh, right now. Some form of earthquake early warning has existed in Mexico for many years. Uh, in the 2011 earthquake in Japan, uh, you will, if you search... Japan earthquake early warning uh, on YouTube. You will see some stunning videos of people, you know, who are working at their computer. They happen to be running the early warning app or whatever, and you know, a screen popped up, and they got a countdown in Tokyo, 30 seconds or so, before the shaking uh, began. Now, there are some nuances, there are some challenges uh, with this, uh, and but uh, it's something being very actively pursued in this country. I have to tell you, uh, in California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, the U.S. House of Representatives voted last week for the first time to put money toward earthquake early warning uh, into the FY15 budget. We'll see if it makes it all the way through the process. But that does represent a significant step because it would be the federal government's first uh, major investment, a down payment, if you will, toward trying to accomplish uh, this. Uh, it's a very sore spot for me uh, because, uh, you know, Alaska is different. We do have some, some different challenges. We do have a, a, a different kind of population density than, say, uh, California. And that's all very true. But I am uh, a bit stunned that Alaska does not even appear as a footnote in this national discussion right now. The West Coast tsunami, or I'm sorry, the West Coast earthquake early warning system includes absolutely no provision or even mention of Alaska. So you brought it up the creation of things. Yes. Um, the earthquakes here are happening because of the flight tectonics. How about the interior things like on the Mississippi and mountain ranges like the Rockies? Um, are the biggest quakes all around in the, uh, the you know, where around the edges where the subduction zones are at? Or? With few exceptions, the largest and most frequent earthquakes in the world occur along plate boundaries. However, that plate tectonic paradigm, right, those plates moving around. Think about it. There aren't open gaps between plates. Right? There's not a portion of the earth where, uh, you know, where there isn't a plate. Everywhere's covered in something. They don't fit that well. They're all irregularly shaped. So uh, the idea that this idea of, of individual plates moving around is a good one, but it's got some nuances in it that doesn't actually work that well. So they're always bending and contorting. Uh, the one that, a great example would be the Denali Fault earthquake in 2002. That did not occur on boundary between two plates. But because of that plate motion, Alaska is kind of being sheared. It's, 
Alaska kind of wants to be you know, uh, shared with the, uh, I mean, I'm trying to write away, I would say, with southern Alaska moving toward the west and northern Alaska moving to the east. That would fit the, the particular geometry of plate tectonics right now. So the interior areas of plates are very often responding to that kind uh, of motion. And most of the earthquakes uh, throughout interior Alaska, just to use an example, can be traced back and explained by those kinds of motions. And uh, likewise, uh, you mentioned the Mississippi area. There's a well-known seismic zone, the New Madrid uh, seismic zone, which uh, remains a little bit puzzling. Uh, but it's in some way, a, it's off, actually what most people believe is that uh, on occasion plates tear apart, make new plates, and people, a, a dominant thought is that that is a failed rift. That, that is an area where once the plates attempted to pull apart and didn't quite make it, and now it's kind of a scar. Uh, yes? <laughs> uh, the short answer is uh, we don't have, we don't really know. Um, the, we, it's an area of the state where we have never really put uh, significant field geology resources, nor do we have a long history of monitoring uh, earthquakes. You saw on my slide of the, the, the five seismograms, Ninana was on there. Well, there's a reason Ninana was on there, because we don't have you got to go out to Ninana before you can get five stations uh, worth of data. So we have very little uh, information about that area. There is thinking that there's some motion in the Bering Sea, uh, and there's thoughts that, the, that there's a little bit of tension on the, the, on the land in that area, and that's the likely cause, but kind of with an asterisk and a footnote next to that. Uh, yes, you had your hand. Um, I don't disagree with your, your expectation that, that the same earthquake now would, would, would be just as uh, devastating as it was back then, as, as relates to what we've learned. But what little I know about some of the earthquakes in Alaska, um, uh, you know, they did move Valdez kind of over onto bedrock, I think. You know, and mm -hmm. I looked at like your, your photograph for Seward, there had been development. In, in that one area, but it looked like the biggest development was a parking lot. Um, and I know in Anchorage, because I did a little, little bit of study on that, uh, despite all the politics that went on after the earthquake, you know, there's the buttress area where there's, where there's no building over whatever direction that is, you know, across from Fort Avenue, and there are some restrictions mm -hmm. on the building, and they never rebuilt Earthquake Park, and I'm not sure if somebody probably would if they had the chance, but it's, I guess what I'm Wondering is is if is if in countries that are actually you know rich enough to do something about it, if some of the places that have really suffered devastation have learned at least a few things and taken a few precautions. Um, oh, well, cer you know, certainly, and, and we're an example of that. We, we learned all sorts of things. There there have been great uh, changes in land use, specifically because of 1964 Anchorage. Well, was actually incredibly progressive uh, in yeah uh, Anchorage uh, in the years following the earthquake adopted some of the most aggressive building standards uh, I'm not exaggerating worldwide uh, for many years they had standards in place that superseded uh, the building codes required anywhere else in the country uh, and the international building code uh, what happened and somewhere around 2002 is basically the rest of the standards caught up. So now Anchorage has uh, uh, the same sort of building codes, but it's not because they dumbed anything down. It's because they were ahead of the curve for a long time. So absolutely. Uh, Seward, you are correct. Uh, the majority of the growth in Seward has been, they have a word for it, um, basically day use, uh, not residences, uh, places where, uh, you know, where people are, uh, predominantly during the tourist season and during daytime working hours. So, as long as the earthquake happens at night in the winter, we're all set. <laughs> <laughs> I made mean, fun, but you know, that's a compromise. It's a very hard issue, and it's a very touchy subject uh, in Seward, and for good reason. I mean, it's not like there's, it's not like you just go build, uh, you know, further west or whatnot. You've got a mountain there. You, there's a certain amount of 
plan to work with, and uh, there are very legitimate planning issues that come up. And then on the other hand, Japan built a nuclear power station along the ocean. In hindsight, they would have been. Right. Though, again, I have some sympathy for Japan. I mean, you, you've only got certain areas to work with. I mean, all of Japan is. <laughs> We, we think we're vulnerable. I mean, relatively speaking, for the number of people they have, Japan is a tiny place. And it's not like they weren't thinking about the earthquake problem. They've been by far the most aggressive nation in the world in trying to understand their specific hazards and plan around them. So, you know, they, I mean, the, 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 uh, the tsunami, uh, what do they call them? Not the burns, the, the dikes, the, the, the walls, the tsunami walls that were breached in the earthquake a couple of years ago, you know, I mean, that was incredibly devastating, um, but yet they actually had tsunami walls, which is something largely unheard of anywhere else in the world. Now, it turns out they hadn't considered that particular earthquake, you know, they, they, were, they turned out to be insufficient, but it's, they had put, you know, massive multi-billion dollar efforts towards at least attempting to, to, to treat the failure. Yes. So a couple of years ago in the summer session, we had, it was like 20 things you didn't know about Alaska. Okay. The uh, guest speaker mentioned uh, this idea of lake tsunamis, and I just never really heard of it or considered it as a possibility. So I, because it was such a new idea to me, I wondered how, why there wasn't more information to the general public about the possibility of lake so this is a summer sessions talk a couple of years ago, 20 things you didn't know about Alaska, and lake tsunamis uh, came up. Okay. Um, we have some, we have uh, a, a, a long history in this state of unusual tsunamis. Uh, largely, most, all, most of the ones that I'm aware of have either a glacier or a landslide as trigger, but I don't know what, what they might have pointed out. Maybe they had something different uh, in mind. I'll just take that one, swap out for uh, that mic. <laughs> so, could that um, be a real concern for certain areas? Not just the last seven in the world for me. I'll leave, I'll leave this till later. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you live on the other side of that lake, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a little bit, it, it, it's not a lake, but the Latuya Bay, uh, sorry, Latuya Bay in the southeast, which to this date holds the record for the highest uh, tsunami runoff in the world. Uh, someone can, Ezra, you remember the numbers? Is it 1,700 feet? Wasn't it in your fact book a couple weeks ago? I think it was. <laughs> I think it might be 1,700 feet. Uh, you know, I mean, that, that's a phenomenal height to think about water washing up and, you know, washing away the forest. Um, that was caused by a landslide into water. That's one mechanism. Uh, there was the small, uh, the fully expected annual uh, flood in uh, Juneau uh, from the Mendenhall Glacier. Happens most summers. Uh, again, that's well known and understood, but there are many glacial lakes uh, glaciers have the ability to store up large amounts of water underneath them before some sort of uh, breaching in a, a semi-catastrophic uh, flood. Um, you know, that's one example that I, I know in some places that has generated tsunamis in lakes. But there might be some other mechanism that the speaker was bringing up. Uh, I, I won't disagree with you. I'd be curious to know. Yes, sir. Uh, do volcanoes uh, have a different signature than slip fault earthquakes or whatever? So earthquakes are one of the uh, primary ways that we monitor volcanic activity and particularly the buildup to an eruption. We're fortunate with volcanic eruptions because they very rarely happen out of the blue. When you're going to move a bunch of magma from somewhere in the earth up to the surface, you've got to break a lot of rock to do it. So most of the time, there's a very clear uh, build-up signal in the earthquake data. And yes, there's a very simple distinction between uh, earthquakes, big earthquakes on a fault, 
maybe a single you know, magnitude 7 earthquake followed by some aftershocks, and what we see at a volcano where you know, they might only be magnitude 1 and 2 earthquakes, but there's a thousand of them in six hours. That's more the pattern. Um, yeah, at, a risk, at the risk of offending my other uh, volcano colleagues, I think most people would agree, if you could have just one tool to monitor a volcano, if you, you probably track the earthquakes, uh, only because you, you really can't have an eruption without moving the ground in some way. But the pattern, what you're looking for then, is very small earthquakes, but usually massive numbers of them. So is that the case at Mount St. Helens? Uh, you mean in, in, in 1980? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was no mistaking that Mount St. Helens was going to erupt. That, that, was, that wasn't really debated by the time, uh, what, May 18th, was it, uh, rolled around? Uh, most people, I mean, there had been earthquakes happening for many months, and they had been increasing in number and size uh, throughout that whole pattern. And if you were to plot it, you know, you you got a low curve that's going like this, and it goes steeper and steeper and steeper, and whatever that means, the number of earthquakes per day, or however you want to plot it. That's exactly what was happening. Sure. Yes? The, the term that's used, back to the previous question, the term that's used to uh, describe the event when a glacial lake dam breaches is called the Yoko Lock. Mm -hmm. um, notable one here in Alaska is on the Kennecott River, down by McCarthy. They actually go out and kayak the river when it happens. It's a pretty, pretty amusing. Kayaking the glacial yoke uh, <laughs> from from the Kennecott River. But uh, my question had to do with uh, the uh, the model that you ran of the underwater landslides occurring in Seward. Um, I was wondering if you've ever run one, like a theoretical one, where if a uh, if a landslide of enough volume in the right spot took place, that it could potentially create a wave that wiped out the entire town. So the question is, is there a, a plausible landslide mechanism in, in Resurrection Bay that would wipe out all of sewer? Yeah. Uh, you, know, you could undoubtedly generate such a model. Um, the question then is, is it geologically plausible? It's a hard area uh, to try. It's easy to go back and figure out what happened in 1964. The hard question is to go to other towns and say, well, what might we expect in the future? What, what landslides that haven't happened yet do we anticipate? That's a hard business. Um, and we rely very heavily on geologic investigations and you know, field geologists who are out there thinking, well, you know, this. This hillside over there, it's rotten rock, and it's at the angle of repose. We're keeping our eye on that, a little fishy. Or mapping, mapping the, uh, the seafloor uh, for you know, these sediment deposits. So uh, we could certainly make a model of wipe out sewer. I'm not <laughs> sure I'd want to do that. Um, the, the question is, is it geologically plausible? And at this point in time, there is not a a geologically, uh, according to current consensus of scientists, a geologically plausible uh, landslide that would that is likely to wipe out all of Syria. So, yes. Uh, when seismographs uh, record their data, are they recording P waves, S waves, or both, or is that just outdated terminology? Uh, the question is, when seismographs are recording data, are they recording P waves or S waves? These are different kinds of seismic waves that propagate in the Earth. It, it's not an outdated question at all. Um, seismographs, <laughs> kind of mentioned this earlier, uh, they're really rather dumb. They don't record anything that shakes. And you walk up to it, flick it with your finger, and it won't record that. It doesn't know. It's a vibration. So they are. Uh, absolutely unbiased in what they record. They'll record anything that shakes. For the right earthquake, uh, earthquakes generate different types of waves that propagate through the Earth. Some propagate very quickly, some move much more slowly, and they arrive at different times. And uh, when the data is good, when the data is clear for the right earthquake, many of these different phases, many of these different uh, sets of seismic waves are recorded. So we certainly rely day to day regularly on being able to distinguish the P waves, the S waves, and all these other kinds of features. 
How does it show up on the graphs? Uh, we actually record, uh, I, I think this is interesting, but we record uh, not just one of those little wiggles at each station. We record three. We record one that goes up and down, one that goes north and south, one that goes east and west. So we get all three components of motion. We actually can track not just whether the ground went up or down, but side to side in whichever way. And they each have distinctive patterns. For a typical sort of earthquake, the first arriving wave, the first thing we're likely to see is the ground going up and down, predominantly, followed by a bit more side to side motion. So if you look at all three of those traces, I, I didn't put an example up there, but if you look at all three components of that motion, you would see patterns that separate, you know, that are characteristic of each of these types of waves. Yes? Um, I guess my question is related to prediction. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you were to build a tsunami wall, um, so you would have to decide where to put it and how high to make it. I guess you must use a model of some kind to, to make that decision. What assumptions go into models like that? So we, we do. That's a, that's a great question. The question is what assumptions would go into building a tsunami wall? Uh, now we do we do not build we don't really build a lot of tsunami walls in Alaska but what we do do a very related question is we designate uh, 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 safe zones from uh, what we refer to as inundation zones so you know when, when we put up when there are evacuation routes that go into a town you don't just say go to the top of the mountain right that's a little unrealistic you got you got to decide what areas of town are safe and what ones aren't. And that's in many ways the same question. You're still trying to define the high water uh, mark, which areas of town. A colleague of mine from the other day said, you know, which areas are wet and which ones are dry. It's a way to distinguish it. Um, for Alaskan communities, that's actually uh, something that's done uh, through our shop. For most of our major coastal towns, we've published uh, a set of uh, realistic scenarios, this gets back to the question of can you make a landslide that wipes out Seward, uh, working with experts who know the area to come up with you know, the four or five most plausible earthquake scenarios plus the landslide generated uh, scenarios and which ones are we actually likely to have and then modeling the effects of each one of those and taking the maximum of all of those, taking whichever one is, uh, you know, whichever one's the highest and using that to draw that literally kind of line in the sand of where you, where are you in the inundation zone and where are you safe. So the same, it's that it would be that exact same process. Uh, the, the question about uh, the walls in the tsunami walls in Japan, and this is exactly what they did. They went through and they looked at all of the plausible earthquakes, and they had you know this earthquake here. And remember, they have a, a much longer earthquake history. In Japan, they have written records of earthquakes that go back you know, a few uh, a few millennia. So they've got a long history to look at the repeat time of these earthquakes. And they went back and they identified all these different scenarios and they said, well, we should build our tsunami wall to account for this earthquake and this earthquake and this earthquake. Um, the mistake that was made, or what happened in 2011, that generated an earthquake they didn't think was going to happen. They knew that they should be planning for this earthquake here and this earthquake here. What happened in 2011 is they, they both happened at once. Instead of being two smaller earthquakes, it all happened as one much larger earthquake. And, and you know, that they hadn't thought that was a possibility at the time. So all of this is based only on our best, our best estimates. Uh, and that's, that's an imperfect Science, we're always learning um, you know, more. And you can't always, I have some sympathy for planners. You can't always just build to the higher standard because you know, maybe it was another you know, $5 billion to make those walls another 15 uh, you know, feet higher. Or you know, maybe the towns lost their view of the ocean when you go, well, I don't know, I'm making stuff up. But these are very real, legitimate planning uh, issues that come up. So, it's only as good as the data available. Did the Sendai tsunami walls also subside? Yeah, they subside. Uh, did, yes, did the Sendai uh, tsunami walls subside? That's a, that's a great question. If you think about the slides 
that I was showing earlier and how some areas are uplifted and some are down dropped. That was actually something that wasn't really appreciated uh, until fairly recently. You gotta take that into effect. If you've got land that's gonna drop by 15 feet during an earthquake, well, it doesn't really help you to build a wall that's 15 feet tall. You kind of, at best, you're getting back where you started out from. So that's actually one of the sort of insidious things in the background that has to be taken uh, into account in these models. And in Japan, actually, it wasn't understood that they would subside quite as much as they did. So. Yes? And on a world scale, where did the Alaska 64 earthquake, where, where was it? What was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded? I'm sorry, was that the, uh, the question was on, on the global scale, yeah. so where does it rank? Uh, it, it's considered number two. The 1960 earthquake in Chile was by any measure uh, larger. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's where 1964 was. I will tell you, the magnitude numbers are a little squirrely uh, because the, we, there are, this is only as good as the instrumentation that measures it. And as instrumentation has gotten better, we've begun to appreciate that actually there are signals we were probably missing back then. So the, and I'll let you in on a little secret, but the, the 1964 earthquake is likely to be upgraded from magnitude 9.2 to magnitude 9.4 in the coming year or two. In theory, that would bring it closer to Chile, which was in magnitude 9.5, but the truth is it is probably underestimated as well. Um, there, after the 1964 earthquake, there was a, 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 a quiet period, if you will, globally. There were very few truly massive earthquakes, that is, magnitude, high magnitude 8s and magnitude 9s after 1964. There had been several prior to that uh, in the, the prior decade or so. And we entered a 40-year quiet period uh, that was ended with uh, Sumatra. And since Sumatra, we have actually had, we, we're, we're back in the game now. We've had, uh, we had Sumatra. Uh, there was actually a, a second earthquake in Sumatra a couple of years ago, 8.6, 8.7. Uh, there was uh, Chile, the Malay earthquake. Is that, uh, Lee, do you remember the earthquake, the magnitude on that? 8.8. Eight. Um, we've had, uh, yeah, we had Tohoku in Japan. So we were, we, after this lull, which is an interesting idea unto itself, was that mere chance, or do these things kind of go in patterns? Uh, there's, you know, there's been a whole rash of big earthquakes. And one of the things that we learned, this is a long-winded response, one of the things we learned in the last 10 years from these big earthquakes is that we probably underestimated those earthquakes decades ago. Yes? Were you suggesting that there's a correlation between duration, intensity, and frequency with earthquakes? Uh, a correlation between duration, intensity, and frequency. And a frequency, I guess, duration is one and the same. But it, it, wait, more larger earthquakes or smaller earthquakes, it, are you more likely to have a larger earthquake if you have fewer smaller earthquakes? Oh. Or vice versa. I you know, don't know if there's any correlation. Well, there's a whole field. There's a lot of people interested in these kinds of questions. If I understand what you're asking, you know, what's the relationship between a lot of little earthquakes? Uh, if you don't have a lot of little earthquakes, are you likely to have bigger ones? You're storing up more energy. Yeah, you're storing. Well, that's undoubtedly true. Um, there are places that have lots of little earthquakes, and we've learned actually that it is possible. There are some some subduction zones. Right? This idea of one plate going beneath the other. It turns out there are some that are naturally kind of slippery. They don't actually lock. And they seem to move without storing up as much energy at times. And that's a relatively new uh, er uh, field of study. But uh, in an area of the Aleutians, uh, by the Shumigan Islands, there's, a, there's an area uh, just down... Uh, at the end of the Alaska Peninsula that doesn't have nearly the same kind of earthquake rate of earthquakes as everywhere else on both sides. And you got two, chance, two choices. For a long time, it was thought, ooh, that's where the next one is going to be. Because there's no earthquakes, it must be storing up for a big one. And there was a, there was a lot of effort in the 1970s and 80s 
put toward that spot because that's where the next one was going to be. And that earthquake still hasn't happened. Uh, and there's a growing feeling that, no, actually, it's probably just naturally slippery. And maybe it's not storing up very much energy. Uh, that, that, that remains uh, somewhat to be proven, but there's a growing field of thinking along those lines. Yeah, second question. Yeah, is there any study into the convection currents within the Earth? I mean, <coughs> we're responding to the earthquakes, whereas has anyone put any thought into what's causing the earthquakes? Uh, yes, yeah, so there, there's undoubtedly uh, motions that drive plate tectonics. That's what you're getting at. Uh, I admit, as an observational seismologist, we kind of I tend to take that as, well, that's just the way it is. These plates move. Uh, but, you're, but you're absolutely right. There's a completely separate question and field of study, which is, well, why did the plates move around on the surface of the Earth at all? Why don't we just remain locked in place just like the surface of the moon? The moon isn't broken into plates that are moving around. It's kind of frozen. Um, that's not the planet that we live on, for sure. And convection currents in the Earth have something to do with that. I'm told we should wrap up soon. Uh, one, one question, two questions if we're short. Is that, uh, is that good? OK. Uh, other questions? From... Yes? I think I know the answer to this, sort of, but I want it to be clear. So the, the seismometers at the time of the 64 quake couldn't deal with the energy. What's different now? Can, could they deal with that kind of energy now, and if so, why? Uh, it's a great question. It, it's, uh, the question is why seismometers in 1964 couldn't handle uh, that motion. It's, it's strictly a, a building uh, and engineering uh, feat, really. Seismometers, this blows me away are still, you know, if you were to open up a textbook right now, you'd see a mass on a spring, like a little pen attached to it, which isn't exactly what's inside. But it's not that different. A seismometer has, in fact, a mechanical uh, pendulum or spring or some type of mechanism like that. It is a mechanical device. In, in a world of computers, we, we tend to think now that everything is just you know, done as some, some app or something. But it is, in fact, a mechanical device inside that is incredibly sensitive. Tiny, tiny little springs and whatnot. Um, and uh, it, so it's certainly an engineering feat. And we actually, even today, cannot really build a sensor that is both sensitive to the smallest little subtle earthquakes that we might want to record for scientific purposes, and will still stay on scale when you flip the table upside down. Um, so in fact, we, we operate two different kinds. Uh, we have, uh, in urban areas, in, in Fairbanks, we have nine what we call strong motion sensors. That is, things that can record this without breaking. Uh, our, 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 uh, the primary instrumentation we use, if you were to turn it on and pick it up like this, you'd actually break you would be overloading the, 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 you know, what the insides of it can handle. <clears throat> so we cheat a little bit, but we actually operate two different kinds so, to deal with that. And that, was, uh, that existed in 64, but not in Alaska. Yes? Are, are there any earthquakes that maybe minor that occur because of man-made activities <clears throat> like atomic ground testing or these? big explosions in India during the Pacific or fracking? Uh, we record all of those. Absolutely. I'm and not talking about recording, but... Oh, triggering, know, triggering earthquakes. Triggering earthquakes. Got it. Um, of those, by far, the most controversial is the last. Uh, the fracking question is receiving a tremendous amount of attention in this country um, right now. <clears throat> it's pretty clear that human activities are generating some uh, moderate earthquakes. You need, you need look no further than Oklahoma, where the rate of earthquakes has gone up 700% in the last like three years. That, that doesn't happen by accident. Okay. Now, it turns out it, it does not appear to be driven by fracking, per se, in Oklahoma. There's a separate process, the injection of wastewater uh, into the earth, which is not actually fracking, but is, is a similar t kind of process. 
Um, you'll read a lot of things in the literature. It is, it is for understandable reasons, a, uh, a politically sensitive uh, topic, uh, and, and it, it is challenging. But I can tell you that there really isn't any debate amongst um, my colleagues about whether or not these are being triggered, whether these earthquakes are being caused by the fluids that are being injected.